So two years ago, um, I was here at CSS Day. And uh, that's playing up already. There we go. So I was here at CSS Day two years ago and talking about grid layout. And it was long before grid ended up in any browsers for real. It was hidden away behind experimental flags. And in fact, I've actually been talking about grid layout since about 2012. So turning up at conferences, writing articles, telling people that this marvelous thing is really, really soon going to come. Um, and and, and it's, it's going to be next month, next year. It, it'll be here really soon. And eventually, in March this year, this happened. And we got grid layout in Chrome and Safari, in iOS Safari, and in Firefox, and in Opera in the same month. It just shipped. It was there. And we could start to use it. People could actually start to use this thing. And all of a sudden, Twitter kind of lit up with people going, oh, grid layout. This thing that I've been talking about um, for so long. And within three months, this is the sort of adoption we've got in browsers. I mean, this is a, obviously a, a global statistic. Um, if you add the uh, uh, prefixed uh, IE version, then it rises to about 69%. I have websites which have about 80% of grid support, of supporting browsers that are showing up. Now, obviously, your own mileage, your own customers, the people who come to your websites, they're going to be very different, and it's going to really depend on your stats, how, often, how soon you can start to move to new technologies. But this is pretty unprecedented. For something the size of grid layout that's been in development for such a long time to be there in browsers, you know, really all at the same time, uh, we've not really had anything like this happen before. So I'm kind of pleased about that, because having been talking about it for so long, sort of talking about this CSS vaporware, it was starting to feel like, you know, I was, I was very pleased that it actually did land, um, because I had been speaking and writing about it for about five years. <laughs> the thing is that while learning grid layout and while following this spec and while changing all my examples every time the spec changed, and the period when we had the IE spec, um, and then it kind of changed in the spec, we had no browser implementations, and I wrote masses of code that had no browser that could display it. And I was just waiting, waiting for someone to, to ship something behind a flag so I could test it out and see if it worked. Um, while this, this was happening, you know, the spec was becoming very mature, and it was actually you know, changing and becoming like a very sort of good, solid thing that we could start to work with, which is why, you know, it's landed and it's very usable, but also I've learned a huge amount about how CSS works. Because I thought I knew a lot about CSS, you know, as, as much as anyone. Anyway, I've been building websites for a long time. I've been building websites since before CSS was a usable thing. I started with version 2 browsers. I've been doing this about 20 years. So I thought I knew, you know, pretty much everything about layout and everything about CSS. I knew what I was doing. But the more I dug into the specs, and the more I dug into these newer specs, I realized there was a whole lot of stuff that I kind of knew that that happened if you did this, but I didn't know why. And so I've learned a lot about this stuff from learning grid layout. And so this talk really is just a collection of those interesting things, things about the grid layout spec that I think are quite interesting, and things about other specs that touch the grid layout spec that are interesting, and things I've learned just by playing around and by building examples and heading off down rabbit holes and saying, you know, what happens if I do this? If by going through these things, it makes you think of things you'd like to explore yourself, you know, please do, and make sure you write it up. I think the fact that I've written all of my experiments up, I'm hoping it's hopeful to other people. Um, you know, I've been able to sort of share that stuff with people. But it's also helped to really cement my own knowledge by writing about it, by teaching it. I understand these specifications an awful lot more. So the thing with learning any CSS module is that because CSS is modular and these things all touch each other, you can't just learn the one thing. You can't go and learn CSS grid and not learn about CSS display, about writing modes, about logical properties, box alignment, feature queries. There's a whole load of things that, that touch the spec, and you're going to have to sort of dart from one thing to another. If I'm writing something, I'll often have three specs open that I'm switching between and I'm checking things out in the different specifications. Now, grid is obviously a value of display, so that's as good a place as any to start. So the display module. So this module, it defines how our web pages are laid out. 
how the boxes that are generated get displayed, how they behave in relationship to their parent, and how their children behave. Now, if you think you know about display, go and have a read of it, because there's so much stuff in there, and there's stuff in there. I can read it, and I can read it again and think, oh, I'd never seen that before. You know, has that been added? No, no, that's been there for two years. So there's so much stuff in there that you can play around with, and it's really interesting. But the key thing is we've got these two basic uh, qualities of how elements behave. We've got the outer display type. So how does this box behave in relationship to its parent? And then we've got the inner display type. So what formatting contacts does it create for the child elements? Now, if you set things, say, to display flex or display grid, then it, it becomes block level, um, but its children then take on the flex uh, formatting context or grid formatting context. So we have these two different things that happen when you change the display type of something. So if we go back to the grid spec, we see this wonderful word. Um, the display value of a grid item is blockified. So what on earth is blockified? So to find out what blockified is, we go back to display. And we find that some layout effects require blockification or inlineification of the box type. Those are wonderful words to say on stage. And that sets the box's outer display type, if it's not none or contents to block or inline. So we can sort of see a, a quick example of that. So I've got some items here inside a wrapper element. We've got two inline uh, items, a link and a span, a div, which is block level, and an image, which is a replaced element. And you can see that, as you'd expect, those inline items are displaying in line. They're moving up onto the same line. Um, the block level div takes the full width, because that's what block level stuff does. So if we make the container a grid, the direct children are going to become grid items. The A and the span elements are blockified. They become grid items, but their inline characteristics, so for example, preserving white space, they've gone. Now, the items are grid items. They're not participating in block layout. Instead, they're participating in grid layout. But that blockification happens, and it's useful. We've got these transformations, which is what they're called in the spec, happening. Um, and you might think, well, that's just something for browsers to worry about. They need to make sure that happens so everything works. Uh, why do we, as people who build websites, why do we need to know about these transformations? Now, one reason is it's generally helpful to know why something behaves one way if it's one type of layout and another if it's another type of layout. But it's specifically helpful if you want to create fallbacks for grid and flex layout. Because these transformations mean that we can override older layout methods just by setting something to display grid. A lot of the older sort of things will just go away. We won't need to do anything particular to overwrite them. A very good example of that is display table. Now, this is a very handy way of dealing with those older browsers that don't support grid and flex at all. It's pretty much the only way you can get things like your full height columns or center things. The reason it works is that if you turn something into a CSS table, you give the stuff inside it relationship, uh, which means that you know, item A can say, oh, I'd like to be as tall as item B, that sort of thing. Now, I've actually been talking about display table for a very long time. In 2008, I wrote this. The title was not my idea. It would probably be a better title these days. Uh, but so we've been talking about using display table in this way for quite a long time. And I think it's, it's a useful fallback. And it's also the most complex of the things we might use to do a fallback. Because the thing that happens when you declare something to be a table cell is you get anonymous boxes around the element. And they basically fix up the DOM tree. Because if you've got a, a table cell, well, in a real table, in an HTML table, you've got a row and you've got a table that wraps around it. Well, you don't often have those. If you just, like I've done in that example, I've just set something to be um, table cell, we then get these anonymous boxes to sort of fix up the display so what we have is a real table. So what happens if we then turn our things into a grid item? If we turn the parent of the thing that we said was a table cell into a grid, the thing becomes a grid item. What happens to the anonymous boxes? Do they still float around? Do they cause us problems? Do they wrap our items so we get one grid item rather than two? CSS grid has you covered there. The blockification happens first. So the things stop being table cells before they're transformed into grid items. So the anonymous boxes are not 
created. So this is really useful. This means that what we can do is we can have something, a child of the wrapper that's going to be display grid. We can have that thing as a table cell. We then turn the parent, we say display grid on the parent, the items stop being these table cell items and they become grid items and we don't have anything lying around that's a problem to us. So that means we can override the CSS table display with CSS grid display, creating a nice fallback for older browsers without ending up with a mess in our grid layout. So we don't necessarily need to use feature queries to sort of create two completely different layouts and sort of you know, show one or, or the other. We can actually have it all there, and we can just use the way that CSS works to overwrite the older stuff. That's pretty useful. So here we've got our items there becoming grid items rather than uh, table cell items. In the real world, what you tend to end up using feature queries for is to do things like fixing up the margins, um, setting widths back to auto, anything that both lots of browsers would understand. So if, for instance, a width, you need to have a different width on an item, if it's um, in a table layout or if it's in grid, you might want to set the width back to auto, things like that. In practice, what I'm finding is I have all my CSS, and then I have a kind of block of feature queries, which is basically a bunch of selectors, and then like width auto. And that's kind of all I'm having to do inside the feature queries, because the spec tells us how we can sort of redefine things and things can overwrite each other. So you don't need to write two sets of code. You can write your fallback code and then your grid code, and in many cases, you'll be covered. And you can use feature queries to isolate the things when you're not. And to make that easier, I wrote up a cheat sheet of these sort of fallbacks and overrides and how they work with different layout methods uh, so you can play around and see see how they behave, um, and that, that could be quite useful if you're trying to work out how to do that. And what this kind of brings to mind is that here is a really good place for the expert CSS developer. Because if you don't know how this older stuff works, it's going to be very hard for you to do good fallbacks. Because you're not going to know why one thing does another thing when you turn it into a, into a grid item. So I think it's here, it's in navigating this transitional time there really is a good place for the expert CSS developer and for people who have spent time looking into CSS and working out exactly how to use this stuff, not just relying on the fact that, oh, well, it sort of seems to work. So staying with, with display, really, um, and, and with the grid spec, because in recent CSS grid specification drafts was another value of display, and that was display subgrid. And this kind of had a bit of a history, and, and during the development of the grid spec, this changed around, and it changed how it was going to be, and it was discussed, and it never got any implementation. So nobody implemented subgrid, whereas the, the browsers have implemented pretty much all of the grid spec, um, you know, very, very interoperably, but subgrid was never implemented by anyone. And as the spec went to CR, it would eventually decided we would drop it from the level one spec to enable this spec to be sort of implemented and be complete. So subgrid isn't actually in the current grid spec, but it's still up for discussion. It was discussed at the recent working group. And I would really like to sort of show you the sort of problems that I think it would be able to solve. So we've got this layout. Now, this is the sort of layout you get from a designer who believes in a world where text emerges from the CMS with the same line lengths. <laughs> so everything lines up really neatly. And Look at that and say, oh, that's a perfect, that's a grid layout there. We can create those boxes. So I, I have a, a wrapper around, around those uh, boxes, and I say display grid, and I create a three-column grid, and that's all great, and that, that's perfect. That's my job done. I can now leave. And then, of course, we hook it up to the CMS, and this happens. And I think, well, I'd like to line those boxes up right across the row. I want the headings to line up. I want the footers to line up. I don't want that to happen. But I can't do that while keeping my markup nice and semantic, like keeping each of those cards as a thing, because the internals aren't participating in grid layout. They're in block layout. They've got nothing to do with the, the grid that's around the outside. The best I can really do is do something like this. I can make the internals, uh, say, a, a flex um, container, and then use a, a flex grow to, to make the inside part grow, to, so it pushes the footer down to the bottom. 
Um, and that, yeah, that, that's a bit better. It's a bit better, and that, that may be what you would end up going with. I've had this problem in, in the last week myself, you know. So that's, that's where we get. Now, its subgrid would, let, would sort of let us solve this problem. And, and the spec, as designed, that it got pushed into level two, where it was sort of left, it would solve this problem. So for our subgrid, our main grid would need to have four rows available for each card, because the card's got four elements there. You see, we've got these sort of four rows. Now, if the spec that was removed was implemented now, and there's no concept of an implicit grid. So you need to define all of the rows that you need and all of the columns that you need for your internal items when you set up your main grid. So the outer grid needs to provide the rows and columns for the inner grids. So we know we need those, those four tracks. So we could do this. We could say start on auto. So start wherever you would start with auto placement and span four. And then we just say display subgrid. And then we could get something like this, which I mocked up earlier. Now, this is a little bit of a simplified example, because things like the gutters and stuff, uh, grid gap um, would also cascade down. You'd probably have to end up having to use a margin around the items. But this is kind of the idea. It's all theoretical, of course, because none of this was implemented at all. But the key thing is that subgrid would allow things that were not direct children to participate in the grid layout, which solves a whole bunch of problems and problems that come up over and over again. So I think subgrid's important. If you do too, and the reason I'm talking about it is because I would like to hear what more people would like out of subgrid. Um, these are some links, including a link to an issue on the CSS Working Group drafts issues. So you could go there, and if you've got a good use case, particularly for why subgrid would solve some particular problem, that would be really nice to hear about. Um, as I say, it was discussed at the last meeting. I hope it's not going to go away. I think it's something that we need. Uh, it'd be really good to find out the sort of use cases that people are running into as they're playing around with this. Now, if you ever end up in a subgrid conversation, which is something that happens to me, maybe, maybe only me, <laughs> but people will say this, or other CSS nerds will say this. They will say, display contents. We've got display contents. This solves all of the subgrid problems, and it doesn't. It solves a class of problems, but they are different problems. And to understand the difference between the two things, we need to go back to the display spec. So this is what display says about display contents. The element itself does not generate any boxes, but its children and pseudo elements still generate boxes as normal. The element is treated as if it had been replaced in the element tree by its contents. Yeah, it's much easier to see with an example. So, two sets of HTML there. They are identical. It, one of them's got a class of flex, and one has a class of grid. So we've got three direct children of those, and then um, some nested items. So we made a couple of simple layouts here. One of them is a flex layout. The other um, below is a grid layout. And so that they're very, very straightforward. Um, and you can see the nested items aren't participating in the flex or grid layout. They're just displaying one after the other in normal block flow. And I've put some borders around, so, and I've done that on the direct children. So you can see, well, we've got direct children. They've got a border around as well. We've got a class on the, um, the item that's got the nested items in. So I just say display contents. Um, at the moment, that would only work in Firefox or Chrome Canary. And what happens here? We, to lose the boxes around those items. The border has gone from the direct child that contains the items. And you can see that the items there are actually participating in the flex and grid layout. So despite the fact they're actually nested down, they're not direct children, now the box that was around them has sort of gone. And we can see that they're participating in flex and grid layout. Now, I purposely used a selector that would target the direct children of flex and grid containers with the borders so that you could see that these items haven't become direct children. They're still not selected by that selector because there's still something external wrapped around them. Um, so if in a real example, you'd want to make sure you targeted those as well if you wanted them to then take on the borders and so on that their parent had. Um, so they've not become direct children. Um, and also, the border around the actual item that we've set display contents on, that has gone. 
um, because that's been removed. So you can't put backgrounds and borders on things and then use display content to let their internals lay out um, in, and become flex or grid items. And that is really important when it comes to using display content as a kind of sort of pseudo subgrid. So if you go back to our previous example with the cards we want to have lined up, you might think, well, we could apply display contents to the card. That's the direct child of the grid container. So we'd say display contents. And then this happens. So what you've got there is you've got your title, you've got your image, you've got your contents, you've got your footer, you've got your title, you've got your image, you've got your contents laid out with auto placement. That's exactly what you've asked for. You've removed the, the wrapper which is containing the cards. So you've now got, just got all these little items that are just laying themselves out. You cannot replace by column, but that's not going to work. So you're going to need to know how tall each column is going to be and then what's going to happen to the overflow. I mean, there's possibly some layouts you might want to build like that, but it's not the one I'm building. We need to have the card with four rows available to it, just like in the subgrid example. But that's not going to help either because that card is gone. That, that element isn't there. It's not going to help us out. So what we actually have to do to get anywhere close to this working as we want is we have to place our items using line-based placement, losing the ability to auto-place the individual cards. And so you end up with something like this. This is not what we want. And it doesn't even get us very, really that close. It gets the things into the right place. Um, we've, but we've lost the card background because we can't style the background of the cards. Um, we can't even add margins to it easily because it's gone. Um, this is just horrible. Display contents is fantastic. And when it's available across browser, you will find uses for it. It's very, very useful in certain situations. But what it isn't is subgrid. Um, it's not going to replace the needs we have for subgrid because it, it's not the same thing. It is solving a different class of problems. You want to use display contents if the element you're removing has got no box styling. Now, I think where it could be useful is the sort of markup that goes around, say, form elements and things that is useful semantically. It creates structure, but you don't actually want it there for styling purposes. You know, that's the kind of stuff that uh, display contents, I think, would be quite useful for. Um, at the moment, um, the, the examples I've showed you all work in Firefox, they all work in Chrome Canary. So this is something that is coming into browsers. Something very odd happens in Safari at the moment, I think. Um, but yeah, display content is definitely something you will want to use once you've got it available to you. It's very, very useful, um, if slightly bizarre when you first start to use it and things just vanish. Um, but it's not subgrid, and that's the kind of difference between the two things. So with that, I'm going to jump out of display and briefly to a couple of other linked specifications and things that you're actually going to hear an awful lot more about later today. When I first started talking about CSS Grid, I would introduce the line-based placement properties and then demonstrate the shorthands, finishing with Grid Area, because the order of the Grid Area properties is Row Start, Column Start, Row End, Column End which means that they go the opposite way to the top right, bottom left order we're used to using for setting margins and paddings. And people would go, why? Why have you done this? You know, does the CSS working group like making our lives difficult? Maybe. But really, it's because the new specs have caught up to the fact that the entire world isn't using a left to right and top to bottom language. These things only go the wrong way if you're used to using a left to right language. So if we look at this example, we've got a simple grid. I've placed a couple of items on the grid using that grid area shorthand. So in English, I'm working left to right. So line one is the left hand side of the grid. If I switch the direction, either on the entire page or just on this element, then, then so now we're working right to left. Uh, line one is now on the right hand side of the grid. The order of the lines is still exactly the same. In this case, however, row start one is on the right-hand side. The grid is therefore writing mode aware. The line-based placement that we're using respects the writing mode of the document and isn't tied to the physical direction mappings we've used in older CSS. And so this is where we've got these other two um, things that we need to link to grid. We've got logical properties and writing modes. And I say, you're going to hear a lot more about this from Jen later. So with this sort of strange order of lines, we're setting both starts and both ends. 
Now, you can kind of get your head around that and say, oh, yes, I, I remember that's how grid area works. Grid area isn't something I use that often. I tend to use the, just the, the grid column and grid row shorthands. I think they're easier to read later. However, you need to understand the logical properties once you start to align things on the grid. Because if you're working in English or any, any other left-right language, then start is on the top and left, and end is bottom and right. So if we say justify content end, then our items all end up um, at the bottom right, like that. We don't change our grid code, but change the writing mode to right to left. Now the tracks are aligned bottom and left, because end is in a different place. Wrapping my head around this took some time, just, just remembering that's what was going on and that we weren't working in this world where we could be sure where you know, left was, that oh, the, the end of it, the start of it's going to be left, the end of it's going to be right, that is all gone. Um, it's the same for Flexbox, the same for Grid. It's really worth playing around with this stuff and starting to get, get your head around how that works because it's so key to these new layout methods. Um, another cheat sheet. I've uh, sort of gone through how these work in Grid and Flexbox. I personally think that alignment is much easier to understand in Grid. But once you understand Grid, the Flex stuff seems a lot easier. I think uh, alignment in Flexbox is hard to get your head around. Um, but yeah, so that's a cheat sheet with some examples of those. Now, here is my most recent rabbit hole. We've got this ability to name lines and grid areas. That's really nice features of CSS grid layout. Um, this looks pretty straightforward when you first see it. You know, oh, yeah, we can name lines, we can name areas. That's very nice. However, once you start to pursue this idea, it goes very, very deep and in a sort of very strange direction. Um, and so I'm going to unpack something that I started playing around with uh, a couple of weeks ago. And this is because of this blog post. Uh, I saw a really nice technique. And it was one of these posts where they just kind of go, hey, just do this. Magic happens. I was like, that's a really interesting technique. And I didn't at first, when I first saw it, I thought, what on earth is going on there? And I had to kind of unpack it myself to work out why, because I hadn't thought of, of doing this in this particular way, and it's really nice. So I wanted to sort of explain how this works. So I built this, which is a, a similar sort of layout. We've got a center column, and then we've got a full width item. And I thought I'd just break down the ways we can build something like this and look at naming along the way. So there's the markup. We've got a container, which is a class of grid, and we've got the three items inside. So the very simplest way we could build this is just with line-based positioning. So here I'm creating a grid, three column tracks. I'm setting all of the direct children to start after grid column line two, so they'll go into the middle. Um, and anything with a class of full goes full width. So it goes from one side to the other of the grid. In this case, I'm using line one to minus one, minus one being the end of the explicit grid. In that case, that's line four for us. We've got one, two, three, four. And that's how that layout looks. And that's where the content ends up. So this is fairly straightforward. And that gives us the design that we want. But the example, that used names, not numbers. So we know that we can name lines. And we do that in the square brackets. So I've got full start and full end. They're either side of the grid. And then I've got main around the uh, main column there. And I can just position them with the names rather than the numbers. So I'm just swapping numbers for names here. And I get the exact same layout. So there's the grid. And then we've got our items laid out using those names. That's quite nice. It's sort of better than remembering where the numbers are. That's quite a useful thing to do. However, that's not the same as the example. The example uses the names full and main rather than those start and end lines that we defined. It's kind of like it's targeting the tracks. And we can't do that. We target lines. So I'm not really sure what's going on there. So I carry on digging. We're using these line names that don't exist anywhere. So to find out about that, we need to know something else about grid layout. If you name lines with start and end, dash start and end for your columns and rows, you get a magically created named area of the main name used. 
So here's a diagram. I've got main start and main end, both for columns and rows, and that gives me a named area of main. If I had said foo start and foo end, my, my area would be called foo. So we just create these areas, which you can then use to place things in. So you get code that looks like this, creating the lines and then placing the item with grid area main. So we could edit our code to look a bit like this. But this isn't quite what we want either. I've had to define row tracks here. It's all a bit messy. Um, I've only got a, a line for the main column. I'm, I'm still using grid column main start. I've got that full area. But then if I had another one, well, I can't put two things into the same area named full. This isn't the same thing as the example. It's closer. But it's not quite the same thing. So we need to know something else about grid. What the spec says is that if you specify row or column start as the name of a named area, so in our case main, then the start line will resolve to the start edge of that named area. Which means if you name lines with dash start and dash end, you get a named area. That named area in turn can be used as a named line referring to the start or end edges of the defined area and we're using a shorthand grid column. And if you only give the shorthand one ident, which is what we're doing, we're using an ident string, then the end line, grid column end, is set to the same ident. So that would be the end of that area, which means that we can say grid column end full, which makes the start line the start of the full area and the end line the end of the full area. So what that means is this syntax is really this which lets us target the sort of column track we want the thing to go in, which is how that example works. We have the ability to say grid column main or grid column full. It's a very deep rabbit hole to get to that point, and it kind of exposes a whole bunch of stuff that grid does that you know, maybe you wouldn't notice at first reading. I think it gives some really interesting possibilities, though. You can kind of build a sort of simple design framework by saying, well, these things can live in tracks defined by this kind of syntax. And I basically just expanded on that example, how all this code is online. In this case, adding two panels to the bottom of the layout, just using this same idea of creating um, named areas and, and using those values. So I think there could be some very interesting use cases generally for that technique in terms of creating layouts that are very easy for people who aren't really clued up with, with grid to use. You know, be able to set up something which your team then use because they, they know that they've just got to put things into those named areas or after those lines. That could be quite useful. I think there's some very interesting things around naming and there's more to do with naming that I haven't covered yet. Because I showed you that we get those magic grid areas when we name lines. So if you name lines, you get a start and end, you get an area of the main named used, but you can do that in reverse. You can get magic named lines from your grid areas. So here I've got a layout that looks just the same as the one we've been working with. This time I've used grid template areas, the ASCII art syntax, to lay out the, the design. So you can see here I've got my, my title at the top there and content top, and I've got this full width spanning across. You repeat the name to span it, and then content bottom, and I'm just placing my items into those areas that I've defined. Now, something I'd like to do is I'd like to be able to put a background color and a border on the center track. Now, the thing with the grid layout spec is there's no way to color an actual individual track or an individual grid cell or an individual grid area, you need to have an element in there and be able to style the element. Uh, it's something there's an issue for for level two, because I think that generally people would probably like to be able to style backgrounds and borders and things on, on grid cells. But we can't do it at the moment, so we need to insert an element, you know, perhaps a generated content. And so that's something that I can do with these magic lines. So every defined grid area is inside four lines. You've got your start and end lines for columns and rows. So just like when we name our lines start and end, and that gives us the, the magic area, um, we do the same thing. We, we have our area name, and then it gets start and end depended on for columns and rows. And so we can then use those lines to position our generated content. <coughs> 
So I've got some generated content here with a background and border on that I want. And then I say for column, I'm going to use content top start. I just need to use one of the, the content lines. So I'm going to use that one and content top end. That gives me my columns. And then I say title start for rows and content bottom end. And that basically just stretches it over the grid, setting it to Z index minus one. So it ends up behind everything else. And that's what gives us our example. And you can look at the example code and you can see that the background actually runs behind the gallery, stretches right over the area that's marked out by those lines. Uh, if you go on code pen and fork that and play around with it and see, you know, if you change the line names, you'll be able to see how you can move that around. So that's a couple of things. It shows you that you can do this thing with the magic lines, but also that you can use generated content to create the, the appearance of being able to actually style the grid areas and so on. So there's a lot of complexity in that naming stuff. And the problem with a lot of complexity is that very odd things can happen when you least expect them. Um, and while I was working on this, that's exactly what happened. I built lots of little examples and little boxes, as I tend to do. Um, and I was building an example. And I think, why on earth is this happening? So I've sort of um, tied it up here. I've defined a grid. So we're fairly straightforward here. I've, just got, I've got some named lines. I've named um, main start and main end just for columns, not for rows. And I've positioned some of my items. Boxes E, F, and G, they haven't been placed. They're just using auto placement. So they're just sort of filling in the bottom cells of the grid there. Now, we haven't defined an area for main, for main on the, the rows. We've just done it on the columns. So if I take E and put it into grid area main, I don't know what everybody else thinks might happen. I know what I thought would happen, but it certainly wasn't this. Because why was it ending up there? I could see it was in the right place for columns. I've got main start and main end. So it's, it's correct for the columns because that, that takes it into that position. But why is it ending up after row two of the grid? Um, I read the grid spec. I read it again. I poked around it. I looked at other browsers. I thought, well, everybody's doing the same thing. So if all of the implementers agree, it's probably right. And I went back to the grid spec. And in the end, I direct messaged Fantasy, who's one of the authors and far more intelligent than I am, and said, what is going on with this? You know, am I actually going crazy? And, and what, what is happening with this? And she explained that actually I had defined main when I defined my columns, because I defined it just implicitly, because I'd, I'd defined that area. And so... Because I hadn't done so explicitly, the spec defines the start of that as the first implicit line. So I've got no row lines defined. And so the first implicit line is line two, because you always have line one of the grid. Um, and so that's where it went, because that is sort of correcting the error, really. You know, I'd made a mistake. I should have you know, figured out where it was going to go. Um, so that's why that was happening. But it was incredibly baffling. Um, I think I could have probably worked it out had I long, done everything in longhand. And so, well, where does it end up? And I think that's probably the, the answer to this, is to, to really expand everything out if you're getting something very odd happening. Uh, because if, for instance, you change it to grid area auto main, then it goes to the row where it would auto place, uh, which is a lot more logical. And it's kind of what I thought would happen in the first place. Um, I would also say that, as well as you know, taking things out to longhand if you're struggling, um, if you do find yourself at the bottom of a grid rabbit hole and can't figure out what's going on, put together a reduced test case and ask people. It may well you know, expose something that's very interesting to those of us who are very nerdy about this stuff. I'm always very happy to talk about it. But also, it might expose an area where the spec is not very clear. If you're talking about new specs, often they aren't very clear. You know, and it's only by seeing the problems people are having that we can start to raise issues and say, well, actually, I think we need to clarify this, or we need to put an example in so that it's not unclear to people. So I could quite literally carry on all day unpacking stuff like this. I have so many of these examples, and you can go and have a look at them on, on my site. So don't be afraid to kind of head down these rabbit holes. It's a big spec, but I think there is so much more that we can uncover and so much more that we can start to do. Now we can actually use it in production to solve real problems that we have. And do try and understand how this stuff is working, why it's working, because that really does empower you to do interesting, creative things. And the sort of things that you're going to be hearing about in the next two talks um, are really going to be bolstered by you understanding how these specifications work. And to help with that, 
I've made a whole bunch of resources, as mentioned at the start in the introduction. Um, grid by example is my main place, which has loads of things about grid and video tutorials. If, if this was all new to you, there, I've broken down an awful lot of the key features of the spec in videos. I wrote the guides for MDN. Uh, they're sort of long form um, essays about various things. Lots of stuff. You can follow the history of the spec on my own site. And if you've got one of those reduced test cases where you're having a problem, you can post it to my AMA on GitHub and I will have a look. So I hope that hasn't been too much for first thing in the morning. Um, <laughs> and you'll find my slides and code and everything else at that URL. Thank you very much for listening. Wow. Thank you so much. Can we sit over here? Somebody forgot their jacket. Wow. I used to have this feeling after JavaScript talks, actually, <laughs> <laughs> where I would just understand almost nothing and feel like a complete noob. So <laughs> that's incredible. So much knowledge, and it just existed for such a sh uh, short time. Um, so one of the things that uh, uh, I like about the web is that it's so chaotic. Mm -hmm. uh, and before I saw your talk, I thought actually Grid gave more control mm -hmm. to a designer. So it would actually tame the chaos a little bit. But <laughs> after this talk, I'm not sure, <laughs> <laughs> really. Uh, is that true? Is it not true? I think it depends how you use it. I think that's the interesting thing about the Grid spec particularly is I, my initial interest was... Um, really comes from way back when, when I did, you know, worked with Macromedia and was interested in sort of visual layout tools. Um, and also, you know, I, I build user interfaces, so I'm very interested in a, in a, from a UI design, so really controlling the chaos, you know, using it for, for small bits of UI design. Um, so I think it depends, but also, you know, when you listen to Jen talk, and you know, Mark's going to be talking about this as well, there's so much creative possibility in there. And I think it's really how you use it. It's an incredibly flexible spec, and I think we're just starting to touch on what is possible, uh, which, which is great. And I'm, I'm just really excited to see what people do with it at this point. Yeah, yeah. There's so much possible. I mean, I've been playing a little bit with it, and, well, uh, that's just the service of it, the things you showed. I think it can be daunting a little bit. Yeah, I think so. I think the thing, and what, what I try and say to you now is just, just try stuff and, and see what happens. And you can, there generally is logic to it. When you get back to the spec, you can see what's going on. Or someone will be able to help you. And as I say, you know, I've been working with this for, for five years, and I, you know, still had to go and uh, message one of, the, one of the spec authors and say, what's going on here? I don't understand this. So that's okay. You know, it's okay to not understand this stuff. Um, that's kind of the fun of it. You know, when I, you know, I've been doing this for, for 20 years, and the fact that I can still have great fun heading down those rabbit holes, that, you know, that's, that's enjoyable. I like, I like that. Okay, so have fun for everybody who was thinking, whoa, I'm going back to floats. Oh, <laughs> they're, they're silly things, you know? Just, just play with it and, say, and see what you can come up with. Okay. Yeah, okay, and um, so there's another thing. Would it be maybe easier for people who... One thing I found out about Flexbox is that I found it pretty hard to understand because it was so different mm. from what I had been doing for so many years. But when I teach it to, to students, they say, well, yeah, that's easy. Yeah, I think, yeah. I think that's part of it is that we, we have all of this knowledge, this past knowledge. Um, you know, we think, oh, we can't do that. And yeah. actually, you kind of can sort of throw a bit of that out. Yeah. Now. So our knowledge is in our way. We have to forget everything and start all over again. So there was this genuine question. Somebody asked if you are a magician. <laughs> because uh, you were tweeting while you were talking, and I did see that you were not tweeting. No, it, it's, it's just buffer. There's nothing clever. I'll just queue up <laughs> tweets, and I just hope that everything runs on time. <laughs> <laughs> okay, wow. That's, <laughs> that's cool. OK. So. Those are my questions. Do you have anything else to say to the audience before we start our break? Um, if you've got questions, just come and ask me. I like talking about this stuff, as you can, as you can see. Um, or, you know, tweet at me. I'm yes, at Rachel Andrew on Twitter, and I'm always happy to, to talk about these things and to, to help people explore this sort of stuff. Because um, it, it, it's, it's an exciting time for it. So thank you. I'm sure you've got millions of questions. Thank you so much. <laughs>